so welcome to DIA. Uh, my name is Megan Whitco. I'm an assistant curator here. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's reading. And I'm also very pleased to welcome our two poets. Uh, thank you, Jen, and thank you, Bernadette. We're so thrilled to have you here and for uh, having you be a part of this season. Um, as many of you know, Readings in Contemporary Poetry is an ongoing series here at DIA, and it is curated by Vincent Katz. And in fact, since 2010, uh, when the series was kind of restarted, Vincent has brought more than 100 poets uh, to DIA uh, to read and to share their work with us. So we are all here uh, today in some way due to his commitment to poetry at DIA, and for that I want to say a very big thank you to Vincent. Uh, so a few other thank yous. Uh, Readings in Contemporary Poetry is a part of the Sackler Institute at DIA Art Foundation. And we also want to thank uh, Levy Gorvey Gallery, who provides major support for the series. And additional support is provided by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, as well as our media sponsor, the Brooklyn Rail. And we also want to thank Brooklyn Brewery for the cold beverages tonight, and uh, DIA staff for helping administer the series, particularly Mary Catherine Youngblood and Max Tanone. So following the first reader, we will have a brief 10 minute intermission uh, before resuming with our second speaker. And we will have a section of titles available by both the poets uh, for sale up at the front, as well as uh, a few publications of Dia's, including the newly published Readings in Contemporary Poetry and Anthology. Uh, so I think with that, I will hand things over to Vincent, who's going to introduce our first uh, reader for the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, for those kind words. And thank you all for coming out tonight on this coldish evening. Not really cold, but inching its way towards coldness, maybe. And um, this is the penultimate reading of the season. Our last one will be on December 5th, and we're excited to be hosting David Henderson and Andre Cadresco. So if you're free that night, please come by. Jen Bervin is, to quote from her well-worded website, a visual artist and poet whose research-driven interdisciplinary works weave together art, writing, science, and life in a complex yet elegant way. Her work explores the intersection of text and textiles in acts of reading, writing, and listening through the lens of traditional craft and cutting edge technology. She's published 10 books, including Nets, The Gorgeous Nothings, Emily Dickinson's Envelope Poems, and Silk Poems, published by Nightboat Books this year. Silk Poems was composed in collaboration with Tufts University's Silk Lab in a manner I hope she will tell us more about. Jen Bervin's work is multifarious. If you even wanted to, you couldn't pin it down to one discipline, let alone, let alone a genre or way of thinking about the world. Though there is a way of thinking that ties Bervin's work together. Part of that is discipline in itself, a way of examining material that will appeal to her, then devoting months or years of study and application, at which point her experiments produce results that she collects in whatever form seems appropriate. Her 2004 book, Nets, took all of Shakespeare's sonnets and printed them, grayed out, except for select words and phrases chosen by Bourbon. Silk Poems is a different prospect, visually, poetically. An author's note states it is written from the perspective of a silkworm, and yet it can be read from any number of vantage points. There's a lot of knowledge, a lot of healing in this work. I have to believe that Bourbon's labor of love revealing and transcribing of Emily Dickinson's letter poems has informed her own poetry in silk poems. The visual statement, all capital letters, all words in a line joined together, is paramount. There is a large hush present, and it informs how you read these poems. Quote, I thought you should 
know how it is with the creatures who made this. A whisper of water, a blend of textures. Please join me in welcoming Jan Bourbon to Bia. Bernadette, I've loved your work for so long. This is really fun for me. So, all right. So uh, this book, Silk Poems, that I'd like to share with you does bear a bit of explanation. So I'll try to go through it a little bit. Uh, it's, a, it's a poem, and it takes a few different forms. It's a book. It's a, a biosensor. Uh, sometimes it's a print on silk. And uh, it's a poem that I made in conjunction with Tufts University's Silk Lab. And it's a poem that I wrote in the form of a liquefied silk biosensor. Uh, silk, this 5,000-year-old material in the sensor, is reverse engineered from the cocoon state to a liquefied silk liquid. The liquid is poured out onto a nanopattern surface to make an optical biosensor that can be embedded inside the body under the skin. Good so far? <laughs> There'll be a few goes at it. Um, where the biosensor acts as a quote-unquote reader of the body. So, um, for example, uh, sugar and blood levels or something akin to that. Um, I thought that the material and the context held tremendous meaning and wanted to try to write a poem in it, um, not necessarily because I believe that the biosensor would go to market as a viable um, instance of biomedical technology, but because I believed it was a context that will continue to occur um, in silk and in the body. Silk is 100% biocompatible, so it's just a matter of time to, um, until some context like this one appears, and I wanted to be ready. So um, I researched quite a bit. Uh, it's about a seven-year process, and it was supported by a grant from Creative Capital. I want to thank Sean Elwood, who's in the room, who was a great mentor to me in that. And it was also supported by Bogliasco Foundation. And many people in this room helped make it. Jen Hyde, Charlotte Lagarde. Um, there are people I'm missing, but I'll continue. Um, so the, the piece, when it was ready, premiered at Mass MoCA. It was up for a couple of years. It came down this spring. Um, I'm really grateful a lot of people got to see it, so thank you if you made that trip. In the show, the poem is read through the microscope, so you're reading on the XY axis. And here's what it looks like when you look through. So the poem is written from the perspective of the silkworm, and it's addressed to the person with the sensor inside of them. It's a love poem. Silk is 100% biocompatible, so we will accept it anywhere inside our bodies, even on surfaces as sensitive as the human brain. And the poem is based on the silkworm's deposition or writing pattern, which is what you're seeing right there. Um, in the beta sheet, Silk's DNA self-structures in a very similar way. This is an image of the cocoon, and you can see the filament pattern. So I translated it very directly into the poem. The strand of that poem is composed of letters, and the form is based on the six-letter genome repeat. Um, so here's where I really start to geek out. Um, so in the book, uh, I wanted to translate the biosensor into a printed form, and I love books, so I like to think about what they hold. And in the bottom uh, right-hand corner of every recto, there's an image of the poem strand, and you're actually seeing the strand accrue with the pace of the poem that you're reading. So if you could magnify that little drawing, it would actually 
physically be the poem strand and your place in it, um, just for fun. Um, that, so that's what, <laughs> that's what it looks like when you're, if you were to flip through. Uh, so what else do I need to tell you about the poem before I read a little? Um, so it's, it contains a number of languages in the silkworm because it's a 5,000 year old uh, creature, not literally, but generationally. Um, is really interested in the roots of um, silk language. So the silkworm starts with oracle script, which was the ancient Chinese form of writing. It was inscribed on plastron or tortoise shells. And in that language, you find the characters for silk, silkworm, and in this case, tortoise. Um, and then I also looked into how the radical for silk, the first part of the character for silk, moves in and through different words in, uh, in Mandarin. So I'm not going to read that part, but um, things you should know. Um, the other thing that I should say is that the poem is all in couplets, and they are all caps, no spaces, just to make them fun to read. And um, so that's based on the way that the silkworm moves through a leaf. I really wanted it to reflect the silkworm's um, point of view. So, so now I'll just read the poem. <laughs> Finally. Um, so the poem has a, a preface, which I'll read, and then I'll just jump right into um, kind of late middle of the poem. Um, it is said that silk filature began in China under a mulberry tree in a teacup resting lightly in the slender hand of the empress, Si Ling Shi. A brin unfurls from the frisson tangle. She reaches in, begins to reel, filament from the soft envelope of the cocoon. That is how the people like to tell it. You know the Nigerian proverb, until the lions have their own historians, history will always be told by the hunters. If you don't know it, why not? So Vincent, you read the beginning of the poem, so I'm just gonna jump into the middle. Um, at this point, you're deep into the life cycle of the silkworm, the poem is based on that. It goes through five instars, which are sometimes called sleeps, in which it eats voraciously, um, falls asleep, takes off its skin, and starts again. And uh, I should say that silkworms require humans um, to be a part of their process. They're fed by humans. The humans are rearing the mulberry leaves. They only eat one thing, mulberry leaves. And um, there's a, a pretty deep cycle of interdependence. So um, in the poem, the, the silkworm takes that up as a, a reciprocal care that it's then going to return to the human in the sensor. Good? Okay. There's a pop quiz. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Um, moving in my old skin, inside it, my new skin, feels clear and shiny feels everything. In my fourth instar, I know my true skin is transformation, medium and material. They say I have a short life, but I have an even shorter death. I have so many, it pains me. Imagine this for 5,000 years. Death comes or it comes three weeks later. It's the coming back that's hard. You think I'm morbid? I am. Imagine the language written in me. Memento mori, Morris Alba mulberry, Bombix mori, me. Mulberry, mulberry, mulberry. I move slowly, start from the side. The fine hairs are a shiver. Throw my head back and laugh, and in laughing, trans. Nearly 30 hours. Difficult to extricate myself this time. 
this skin? Who can get me out of it? Adrian Rich writes, love is a process, delicate, violent, often terrifying, a process of refining. I know she meant us. Our name means treasured. Sarah culture is a culture of love, I say in it, of living and dying, of interdependence, honorable relationships, tending and expertise, of rare compatibility. In the expanding universe of my body, I have 28 chromosomes, 14,623 predicted genes, 4,000 muscles, not to brag, six simple eyes to make out light, a robust thorax and abdomen, my retractable head, my pro legs, my true legs, my claspers in the rear. Did I mention my horn? what it's for? Pleasure. Inside me, spiracles, concentric branches, a weft, too beautiful to see. Nabokov writes, you read with your spine. I read with my breathing, a transparent chain of tubes, nine pairs they flower on each side of my body. With each contraction, they circulate delicious oxygen. In movement, freshness. I am fully flat, fledged, fat as a finger, pale slate blue, oyster white, 10,000 times heavier, 30 times longer, about 30 days old, but who's counting? Me. Silkworms love to count. It calms my nerves. I get restless, fidgety, start wandering. My chest goes transparent, and I shrink a little, pinkish, throw my head back and feel like I'm going to throw up. Silk comes sputtering out. Just below my mouth, my spinneret works nine or ten inches in the first minute, 65 elliptical motions. My head is spinning. The brin issues in a glutinous state, hardens into lines, becomes structure. With strength, length, and luster, the fibroid strands emerge prismatic. Two triangular tubes glued in Saracen. When light shines through a prism, it breaks into seven colors, a continuous spectrum with infinite possibilities. With elasticity, affinity, and the right mindset, all ways are easy. Once I start weaving, I can't hear. A practice is not a thing in and of itself. It is a way to be happy and calm in life. I write it side to side, infinity loops, figure eight spins, as much as six miles, 60 hours, three days, sure, I count. I modulate it, slow it down, elongate the loop, concentrate on the line. I try not to have ideas because they're inaccurate. Instead, I try to think of the words I want to spend time with. Beta sheet, ostrephodon, weaving a weft thread. An elegiac couplet, an epitaph, carved in alternating directions. To reverse the reverse becomes the work. To separate your right brain from your left and build back up to remove specific outcomes and truly create something new. Even that word looks old. Silk, language, mediums infinitely larger than any intention. This little silk in me, polymath, string figure, present, small wild things that shine obstinately. Hold the body free from harm, cloth tissue, body issue. Here is this thing I made of myself with others alive in you. I give you my silk cocoon, this flying garment for the soul. I've drawn infinity into it. Thank you.
Bernadette Mayer is the author of over 27 collections of poetry, including Memory, Studying Hunger, Midwinter Day, Sonnets, A Bernadette Mayer Reader, the, desires, the Desire of Mothers to Please Others in Letters, Another Smashed Pine Cone, Poetry State Forest, The Helens of Troy, Eating the Colors of a Lineup of Words, the Early Books of Bernadette Mayer, and Works and Days, published by New Directions in 2016. With Vito Acconci, she edited the journal Zero to Nine, and with Louis Warsh, she edited United Artists, books, and magazine. From 1980 to 1984, she served as the director of the St. Mark's Church Poetry Project. Mayer was the recipient of the 2014 Shelley Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America. Bernadette Mayer's poetry has been with us and been accorded the status of hugely influential for so long and her body of work is so voluminous that it is almost difficult to find a way to talk about it. That comes from a quality in the work itself. It is large, even when it is not written in large blocks of text, and its largeness can seem to render it impervious to analysis. Some of it, too, is that Mayer, for all her assiduous scholarly pursuits, has often worked to present language within the context of the non-analytical mind. Some of her earliest poems look like lyric poems on the page, but they're not. They're weird, quirky, fragmentary takes embodied with human feminist grit. She's worked from the minimal to the maximal and everywhere in between. She has mined the classics, particularly the spicy parts, and she has remained fervently non-literary in works devoted to anything going on any day, inside or outside a house, probably the house of a bohemian, anarchist-leaning, avant-garde artist. But back in the day, that was a common enough type. These days, the commitment to living one's life outside the bounds of normal society, in language, in life choices, in what the poet chooses to highlight or observe, resounds even more significantly. A short poem in Works and Days, I Am a Coyote, reads in its entirety, on the go, I'll fool you into thinking you're one too. Who's to say I can't do it? Not I, and I'm guessing not you. Please join me in welcoming Bernadette Mayer. I'm going to read, open with a poem I wrote for a silkworm, I mean an artist <laughs> named uh, Sarah Kane. <clears throat> She's a lot like a silkworm. <clears throat> Dear Sarah, now I'm going to tell you everything. At the creek end, I saw a beaver checking out a hole near where we saw the black snake. I threw a rock and it backed out so I got to see the paddle tail. For a few days, I saw it swimming sleekly in the creek, or I'd hear the thunk of it like a rock landing in the water near where I saw a deer drinking. I think people see what they're thinking or are afraid of. A deer with antlers. This was how John Fisk pictured a deer. I've never seen so many other than garter snakes than when I'm with you. Once a guy came to our house to warn us a disabled copperhead was slithering into the bushes. Further into the poetry state forest, I see suddenly a chipmunk. Then the goats Harriet's son was raising. My green plastic Adirondack chair is chained to a tree. Bill told me to do it because the local kids would steal things all the time leaving their Bud Light cans fine. For a while, we'd find Simpsons comforters, once a SpongeBob SquarePants one. 
Now I begin to see the deer poop. When I first saw this house, some kids were carrying jars of crawfish. Some girls told me they won't swim in the creek because the crawfish nipped them. Once I saw a luna moth cocoon on the Kundir Creek bank. This was be where before the Gobofi had forbidden us to walk on his property. We'd always had absentee landlords before. The Poetry State Forest is a narrow strip of woods between other people's property. I see darning needles there and the crawfish, and once I saw a slug, once I saw garter snakes hatching, but the best was the blue heron, but it got hit by a car and is no more, and the tree in the middle of the confluence <laughs> of the Tasawasa and Kinder Creeks has fallen down and has leaves growing on its root ball, resting in the kinderhook by our swimming place. Once I saw a locust while making a tape with Jamie Jones and Dave Brinks on the creek bank, the muddy part. Of course, I see squirrels. Once I saw a mink, but that was in the winter when nobody'd be watching. I don't see the mink anymore. I see fish jumping. There are trout stocked by New York State. And I see fishermen on April 2nd. Once I saw, was walking through the Poetry State Forest and a fisherman said, hey, you want to see my trout? I thought he'd give me one for dinner, but I guess it was just an achievement. If the creek gets almost dry in August, the herons can eat the fish. Once I saw a wild turkey displaying. Once Phil set the field on fire and the volunteer fire department came and tried to recruit him. Many times I've seen the creek mon monster, which nobody else can see. Once I saw a bear running across the field. It stopped to rear up so I could see how tall it was. Once I saw a groundhog, then a disabled bat in my backyard. The bat went under the propane tank. Once a bear broke our bird feeder in two. Bears, groundhogs, and beavers are bigger than you think. There were a lot of deer this year. I've been told the price of a funding li license has gone up. Once Bill's wife saw a mountain lion behind their house. We're at the southern end of the Rensselaer Plateau here. It's an animal corridor. Harriet once saw a moose. In the middle of my house, I see a painting on a slice of redwood tree. It's all the colors, including aquamarine, and it's by you. How did you get here? How did it get here? I, st I saw a squirrel sneak into the bluebird house. It's the hottest, most humid day of the year as I write this, Thursday, July 30th, 2015. In honor of the painting of yours I have here, it's like seeing a rainbow in the middle of the forest when the bark of the sycamore starts to fall off in June. It has a pattern, just like your redwood slice painting. So the slice is made to resemble the perpendicular bark and makes you think of peripatetic periwinkles, which make me think of incipient periwinkles, which make me think of ice cream cones from a truck which stops to sell them even to a tree, and the sprinkles are of all the colors, so we can begin to eat now. What we're eating is letters, which make words that aren't genetically engineered, and I've become words without growth hormones and taste like cherries and blueberries and plums created out of magic under a rock under the truck, acts accidentally like evolution, messily like a forest with no meaning, but that you can see the sky and predict the weather, but you might be off easily getting there too early to bump into your friend who just died and with her, you fly to somewhere, and that's how you see each leaf. And though each leaf is outlined in black, the squirrels have moved into the blue jay's nest. Crisscross applesauce, somebody might be you, though they won't 
be the bee's knees like you, and I do thank you for finding that slice, painting it, and giving it to me and my house. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> I, I never read that poem before. Oops, what is this? Oh my God, it's part of the microphone. <laughs> Oop. I'm going to read uh, one of those uh, old poems that uh, Vincent was talking about. I had this habit uh, when I was first beginning to write of writing poems that uh, was a cert were a certain color, and this one is called, uh, all the words in this poem are this color, and it's called yellow orange. My jig was a sage ear. The mirror focuses on warm fog, wise marrow ram, queer fig, curious razor smear in a coffee mix. The war was a sexist sore for merry rims. As far as I come, the sow and the ram wager witch arrows. Various sim is a coxic rage. My soul, wax samurai, swore on his swarm rock arrow. Come with a quick wag of veer, carry sex, ask ears frame, carse a rim, game in a jock axe searing, and curry the same maze in exotic, says the worm in cox, in jam. <clears throat> and this is one of my favorite old poems. And this is a description not of a color, but of the, these are all thick words, uh, and so it's called thick. <laughs> Hashish the ghost is rumored dead. The slow boar has had the room, worm and bug gagging him, higher than a gourd shouting whoosh, a shower and, a, and the rum, you piggish rue, to oust your mother from the same shroud as you. Owl, bitch, hog, and whore met at the bog's mouth to bludgeon the womb. It was only a gag. At least the author has brought his luger. He's ogling that myth. A gob of rum for the wretch with the hookah. The oil rout grew, bulging the gulch with rush and shout. There boils the ocean. And this is a, a poem that uh, Bill Berkson was my teacher for a while, and he said to us in the class, uh, so what do, you, what do you all think distortion is in poetry? And I raised my hand and I said, well, it's when you use all thin or thick letters. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> This is called Francois Villon Follows the Thin Lion for Bill Berkson. Fill the tin voodoos, Ovid's dill, Ovid's dill moon, the doffers hunt to loop, dollless in linnets. Dylan pilfers ulfus, fin lips, the thinning third of Avoir Dubois, Dubois. Huns unlid at the onager's kiln, a flint and a lynx, the infinite minnow. Off lightning, fools lift digits, the lieutenant fills the ocean, give him onions. <laughs> I think I was a much more interesting poet when I first began to write. No. <laughs> uh, these are uh, poems from uh, my newest book, Works and Days. Uh, this one I wrote for my workshop uh, because we were doing a class on uh, line endings. 
and it's called leg of lamb. A line break could reflect the way the sun breaks through the clouds or breakfast or a rainbow begins here and thens over. There, too, the aurora borealis can be all over the sky, wherever you look, not in one place like north, up and down, east and west, southwest, side saddle, acrobatic as a squirrel. A parhelion sun pillar appears on each side of the sun in cities. Is an email directional? I guess I'll just think and be as smart as in dreams so they don't come to get me and take me away to Zanzibar, the mental asylum, the hospital, the jail, turn the line and you wind up in Antarctica, Australia, Mesoamerica, mesothelioma, the middle of nowhere somewhere. You've left all the slush behind, back there where the line begins, ends, do we notice? Yes. Are we sorry? No. Maybe. Always. Sometimes. Never. We will come. never come to an end because starting over is our addiction, a dead end. And where does that leave us? <laughs> uh, this is a... Well, it's obvious what this poem is about. It's called, Why Are There Thorns? Uh, in Denmark, they're trying to figure out a way to say without words how not to dig in the place where they buried nuclear waste. And this was a book about, uh, about nuclear waste. It's kind of sad, isn't it? In perfect alignment, you, the paper, let my no words wind up over to you in your vicinity. It's like infinity, like a lily pad, like a defrocked priest, or a nun in a deconsecrated church, an excommunicated atheist, fellow, a whirling dervish shrink wrap, uh, books, The Immaculate Conception, that guy's not home. He's missing from the tabernacle. He's lost, I'm found. It's a miracle to behold your erect penis, penis, the duck's corkscrew vagina, the forensic on a TV show, the full frontal nudity of a star, the elegant dreaming universe. When did you get there? When will you take the train back? Art for art's sake? I don't think so. Let's start over, begin again now. Who could ever meet me then? You think so. I doubt it. Yes, it's your eighth thought out of an infinity of utopian giggles humming in the background of the Empire City, which is nowhere would you would ever you would ever go without my relatives and all their belongings on top of a truck when the mountains turn blue the beer beer is cold yes it's eight it must be eight it is number eight a path where no man ever thought <laughs> James Scholar's Roadshow. In the James Scholar Roadshow, there's no dearth of interesting pe people. I was saying our group leader is very weird when someone pointed out he was right behind me. It was the way he grabbed the lapels on the coat on Vito's dead body that made him murder a woman in a cult. Ann Wallman and Ed Bowes were, were there, but they weren't married yet, followed by a failed Sestina about Bush. The end words are downfall, fallout, Bush, which writers fuck. Here's the last line, the last stanza. It's based on a poem by Catullus. Come here, all of you, my Sestina writers. I'm coming to you from East Nassau, which is having Indian summer. It's 60 degrees, and Bush is still ostensibly president of the fallout from his lies. I wish for his downfall. Fuck you, you fucking fuck. Bill Berkson brought his dildo to sex camp. 
but you were supposed to have sex without anybody knowing. What I was worried about were orgasms, but I could come at the drop of a hat. You had to leap up to go to the bathroom. Bill's dildo was like a sock darner, or maybe, <laughs> more likely, a darning needle. All under underworld queens need bees, blonde assassins. There is a female Farley Moat there. Everybody's speaking rongo, rongo. What is a vanilla mask? Everybody in the dreams taking a different drug. One is Soprasin. I found Charles Bernstein's pen on which he had written Property of Charles Bernstein. <laughs> Then we found his dead body, but he wasn't dead. On the bus, you could count things. The former budget of Bushwick is being returned to Qatar, sped along by horses on a boat. Everybody was going to their after-school activity, activities so I could be alone with this guy who locked himself in his room. I don't remember why I wanted to. You can't figure out who all the people in your dreams are. Everybody drinking coffee had their own pot. I say I'd like a little coffee in a big cup, but I just get sips of other people's. Lewis has to list very, listen very patiently to what Anne is saying. I dream I bring back from the dream some iced Sprite from the kiosk in front of every elevator door in Peggy's ancestral building. Turns out we're at 88th and DeMott. We pass a sign. Soon there'll be a jump shop, junk shop here. I explain that like those liquidation signs, it's not necessarily true. I buy a knitted shirt that says, Look up at the sky around the collar. Who should it be for? Hmm. Uh, this is called Creepsville. Millions of paper dollars, dollars suddenly come from behind a tree while you're looking under a rock for money to pay for a gift of pillows. What do the dollars look like? Purple and orange striped like a sunset at Love Canal, except, invisible except for its hands. I'm afraid of this dollar thing. It might eat me. I hope I never get eaten by money so that my essence will, would emerge in its shit. <laughs> uh, sway bar blues. Oh, sway bar, b sway bar, another incomprehensible automobile part. It costs $200 to fix so Phil can get to his job to pay the sway bar bill. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, uh, pages of books, they always have two sides. So you ha I have to decide which poem to read. I know, it's a problem. <laughs> this is called Cardinal Flowers. When in the course of human events, I summon up remembrance of the walk we took, I see nothing I don't see, maybe I was blind or so enraptured by the sights of the creeks. How many things can you keep in mind at once? I said, I don't see those creeks, but I did, except I can't remember anything. Now I both lied and lost sunny memory, so recently stored away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord pathway. I wonder if I should drink coffee. Now I remember less than nothing. What does that mean? I feel so attabled. I might be the something, someone else. I threatened my sister with being and nothingness. You know, I remember I wrote that poem because I wanted to use the word attabled, because John Ashbery had used that word in a poem, and it's really not a word, as far as I can find out. A-T-T-A-T-A-B-L-E-D. 
a table. Look it up. <laughs> My love is, a, is like a red indicator. This is after Robert Burns. My love is like a red indicator that's newly sprung in thermoelectric assembly. My love is like an auto range interface that sweetly played in tweezer tip sets. As fair thou art my bonny bit drivers, so deep in matrix displays am I. And I will love thee still, my dear, when all the torrid cores gang dry. When all the tubings gang dry, my dear, and the ban banana binding posts melt with the clamshell cases, I will love thee still, my dear, while the dual alphanumeric displays display. <laughs> and I'm gonna close with my brand new poem uh, which is boringly anti-Trump, anti as I know the guy who fixes the microphone told me that everybody was anti-Trump. So um, maybe I shouldn't really read it. Okay, see you later. Uh, and it's called The Dressing Gong. I hope you've all seen Downton Abbey. That's where the title comes from. From now on, there will be no fun. Nobody can even snicker, much less laugh out loud. Secret underground tapes, tapes of laughter will circulate. And if you get caught with a laughter tape, you will pay more than if you had sex. Laughing during sex results in Siberian trees falling on your house. And plus, you must live with Trump forever in a casino to create a nuclear summer, fall, winter, spring, snow, laughing matter. You'll have nothing to eat. Nothing will grow that's edible. Crop sprayers like demons will render all your vegetables poison and you will become a Republican determined to destroy the joy of it all. And you will become a Republican of the sort that creates explosions, showering gold on corporations like a kilo nova, while the other classes can't even eat fruit. You think instead of peas, you can eat pears, but even the tomatoes will be wasted like helicopters looking in vain for marijuana. And don't go to Madagascar, they're having the plague. Dig your caves now and laugh in them pronto. Car wax, symptom of sardines, whether our friends and acquaintances at funerals, in tenements, it's scintillating to fight and die for our car culture with its breathtaking gas stations and brutalist architecture of Howard McDonald's. And sex isn't illegal as long as you abuse the female. But let's get to the meat of it. This guy has got to go. Chance and Pence and Dense, they're both so dense and frumpy. Hence, I think how long will I have to spend on death row? Or will I die before they kill me in a mall, school, or church shooting? Or maybe I'll even go crazier and they'll let me get a gun so I can shoot you and then me and together we'll go to the abyss of doom a fancy hotel in either heaven or hell at $5,000 a night featuring fake squid rolled in rare artificial flavors, handcrafted raspberries dribbled over fresh ticks with music by a strand, transgender Trump lookalike and a group of black break dancers performing their greatest hits. Fuck white supremacy and Whose side are you on until the dressing gong rings? Thank you. Thank you.